With me now, Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford and Senior Fellow of the Center for European Studies at Harvard. What a well-qualified guest, Neil Ferguson. Neil, it's so great to, to see you tonight. I really appreciate you joining us. We were going to talk about your fascinating new book. We'll get to that in a second, but I just wanted to get you on this incredible new story of North Korea. I can't think of someone more qualified to help us understand it. You, you, you're a historian, world-renowned historian. You've, more interestingly, I think you've always been a kind of anti-establishment conservative. And this move by President Trump on North Korea has really kind of left the foreign policy establishment with egg all over their faces. What do you make of it in the context of the history of this conflict? Steve, it's great to be with you. The overwhelming majority of pundits are screaming that Donald Trump has made a terrible mistake. These are the same people who were screaming last year that he was making a terrible mistake by threatening North Korea with fire and fury. So it's always a terrible mistake in the eyes of the Washington <laughs> foreign policy elite. And I, I think they don't understand uh, nearly as well as, as President Trump the way to get to North Korea, which has been through China. Uh, if one looks mm -hmm. at this from the vantage point of Beijing, President Trump's exerted two kinds of pressure over the last year. One has been the threat of military action, which really did have, I think, people pretty worried, not just in Pyongyang, but in Beijing. And the second has been the threat of a trade war. Uh, and the tariffs, which the same foreign policy pundits have been slagging off like crazy, have also got China's mm -hmm. attention. So I think the reason that there has been real movement, the reason that Kim Jong-un has stopped firing missiles and is now uh, open to talks, is that there has been meaningful pressure. And remember, the exact opposite happened under Donald Trump's predecessor, Barack Obama, who allowed the North Korean program, the nuclear program, to advance uh, at an extraordinary rate. So by comparison with President Obama, President Trump has made significant progress. I'm not saying there's no risk to meeting with Kim Jong-un. There clearly is a risk. But in foreign policy, you have to take risk if you face this kind of threat. Well, I think that's such a great summary. I, I basically exactly my my uh, thoughts on it, too. And I just wanted to ask you now, just again, looking back over the years, what do you think the chances are of uh, this, this really big goal that they're talking about, which is the denuclearization of North Korea, not just a slowing down, but a complete um, abandonment of any of their nuclear ambitions. Do you think that's even a realistic goal? I think it is a realistic goal. I don't think that it's 100 percent probability, but nor do I think it's zero percent. The Chinese are open to the idea of a denuclearized Korean peninsula, and that is the key variable. Remember, this is really a negotiation with a superpower, China, with North Korea as a rogue regime between the two superpowers, the United States and China. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult thing to do this. It's perfectly possible that Kim Jong-un will be like his father. He'll cheat. He'll come meet, talk and then carry on with his uh, nuclear arms program. So we have to accept uh, that he is a highly untrustworthy, highly unreliable negotiating partner. But I think the pressure on China is, is really the key to all of this. And I think President Trump has hit on rather an ingenious formula, uh, simultaneously raising the possibility of unilateral military action by the United States against North Korea, which would blow apart China's claim to be the dominant player in Asia, or this threat of a trade war, which although it causes the foreign policy establishment in Washington to freak out, exerts meaningful pressure on China because it would hurt China much more than the United States. If the U.S. targeted China with tariffs rather than just doing across-the-board tariffs on steel and aluminium, that would really hurt China a lot more than the U.S. So this seems to me the key, and all along, I think, President Trump has sought to get a solution to the North Korean problem through China. And I do think that's the right way to go about it. That, what brilliant analysis. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to uh, switch now to talk about your book, The Square and the Tower. Um, it's, an, it's a magnificent sweep through history, um, as we'd expect from you, Neil. But I just would love you to explain to our, to our audience watching tonight what they should make of, make, make of it. Why is it important to, to their lives here in America today? Well, most of us, I think, tend to assume that the internet changed everything and Mark Zuckerberg invented social networks and nothing like this has ever been seen before in the history of mankind. And part of the point of my book is to show that that's just nonsense, that the effect of the personal computer and the internet is a lot like the effect of the printing press uh, on 15th and 16th century Europe. And we can learn from history. 
history. We can learn, for example, that what happens when you transform the way in which people can network, the way in which they can communicate, often is a revolution. That's the title of your show, Steve. We live in revolutionary times because the Internet has created new, enormous, very fast networks. And most people, including mm -hmm. the people who built those networks, underestimated the revolutionary consequences of their coming to, into existence. And so what do you think, looking forward, that means for the way we think about, um, you know, let's, let's just take one example, a company at the heart of it, Facebook. How should we think about that I in think, the context of the history? Steve, I think one of the biggest questions that the Trump administration faces is what to do about Facebook. This is now the most powerful content publisher in American history. Mark Zuckerberg is more powerful than William Randolph Hearst at the height of his power. 45% of Americans get their news from Facebook, about 80% of all news uh, is really consumed by referral from either Facebook or YouTube. These are incredibly powerful companies, but guess what? They're not regulated in any way as content publishers. They're not regarded as media companies. They're treated mm -hmm. under mid-1990s legislation as, as technology platforms with absolutely no liability for what they publish uh, on their platforms. And I think this is really the important thing, a completely non-transparent way of editing and sourcing content. The Facebook newsfeed algorithm is the most powerful editor on the planet. And remember, the overwhelming majority of people who work at Facebook, including its founder and chief executive, Mark Zuckerberg, lean to the left. They are liberals. Uh, Peter Thiel, I think, is just about one of the last remaining conservatives uh, in Silicon Valley, and he just left. At least he left town and moved to L.A. So if you think about it, I think there's a collision coming between the Trump administration uh, and Facebook. And the big question which confronts policymakers is, should you break up these giant technology companies, which is what a lot of people on the left want to do, the antitrust folks, or should you, as Steve Bannon argued shortly before he left the White House, should you regard them as utilities? I mean, in the end, they're becoming mm -hmm. the public sphere. They are where our democracy communicates. They are where people consume news. And I do think that Republicans need to think again the question of whether it is right to, con to mm -hmm. continue to leave these companies more or less completely unregulated regulated when they are now as powerful as the big TV networks were back in the middle of the 20th century. Neil, th as you say, it's such an important question. Thank you for laying it out for us. One thing I just want to say, I think everyone should read your book. There's a particular bit in it that I know our audience will love, and that's the way you lay out the origins of the administrative state, something we, mm. we focus on a lot here. But the whole book is brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. and hope you can come and join us here in, in the studio in Los Angeles at some point. Love to do that, Steve. Thanks.